Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 13 through verse 17, looking at the armor of God this morning. This is what God's word tells us. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You may be seated as we go to the Lord and ask his blessing upon our study this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wondrous grace and mercy to us. Lord, we pray that we would receive your word well, with meekness and that you would bless us. Lord, guard me from error. Feed your people today. Instruct us in the way of everlasting life by pointing us to Jesus. We love you. Bless this time in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at verses 10 through 13, specifically seeing that we had been called to be strengthened in the Lord, to know who our real enemy is, and stand firm until the day that Christ returns. This morning, what we're going to see is that as Christians, as those that are at war with Satan, we are completely dependent on Christ for our strength, for our safety, and ultimately for our victory over the one that wages war against us. Now, one of the things I didn't mention last week, and we're not going to spend a lot of time looking at this morning, but we need to have as a point of reference, is that The context in which Paul gives this instruction of the spiritual battle is important for us to see because what we're going to talk about today could, in one sense, seem very um, disassociated with or disconnected from our real life. You may go, oh, spiritual warfare, that's just kind of theoretical. It's out there. It, It doesn't really have any pressing significance for me. But I want you to see that Paul is giving these instructions about spiritual warfare after having looked at how we relate to one another in our marriages, in our relationships with our children, in our relationships with our neighbors, and even with those that work for us. So the context of spiritual warfare is in our day-to-day relationships. And what that means is that the enemy, Satan, He intends to attack you in your marriage, in your relationship with your children, in your relationship to your neighbors, in your relationship to your co-workers and your peers. So if you don't feel like talking about spiritual warfare is incredibly practical, it's partly because you've already bought into the idea that you are not at war and that these core relationships are not at risk. And what the enemy wants nothing more than to do is to ruin your marriage, ruin your relationship to your children, disrupt your, uh, your relationship with your neighbors so that you view them as enemies instead of as those that you are to love and care for. And if that's the case, he's got you. He is going to win that spiritual battle. Now, the war, the victory is assured in Christ, but it does not mean that our faith cannot be wrecked and ruined at times in our lives because of our unwillingness to see that there is truly an enemy of our souls that's prowling around like a roaring lion seeking to devour you. And so, I need you to pay attention to the fact that there is someone that wants to see your marriage fall apart. He wants to see your children fall away. Wants to see you in conflict with others. So how are you going to wage that war? That is what Paul is going to talk about today. How do we stand firm in fighting this enemy of our souls? There are six points in these verses Ephesians 6, 13 through 17, that I would have us to see this morning. And since there's six, we got to be moving. So the first is found in verse 14. It's this. Christians must bring every aspect of their life in subjection to the truth. 
Christians must bring every aspect of their life into subjection to the truth. If we're going to stand firm, to, to resolutely stand in opposition to our enemy, as Paul would say, then the belt of truth must be buckled around our waist. Some of your translations will say, girding your loins, having fastened on, this idea of securing or tightening. In this case, the soldier's armor is held together by his belt. And by having this belt fastened tightly, the soldier's armor would be held in place and they would be ready for battle at any given moment. Likewise, the believer is to orient every aspect of their life around the truth. The question then is, what is this truth that we are to orient our life around in light of what this passage is talking about? It is God's truth. When Paul talks about the armor of God, he's likely got Isaiah 11 in mind, which states, also, righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness, also translated truth, the belt around his waist. And here in the context of Ephesians, It is none other than the truth of God as it is revealed in the gospel, which we can see in places like Ephesians 1.13 and Ephesians 4.20-24. As believers buckle on this piece of God's armor, they will be strengthened by God's truth as it is revealed in the gospel. And as a consequence of orienting your life around God's truth, you will begin to display the characteristics of the God that you follow in your attitude, in your language, and in your behavior. There is not any aspect of our life that is to be exempted from the influence of God's truth. Did you hear that? There there are not aspects of our life where we get to say, God can speak with authority there, but he can't speak with authority here. And the world loves to do that. The world loves to let God speak in some areas, but not others. I mean, and, and I almost don't even have to explain this because it, it's, so, it's so evident. Everyone wants to hear the authority that says God is love and God is forgiving, which is absolutely true. It's what we preach. It's what we hold on to. It's what we're going to talk about every single time that the doors of this church are open is that God is a God of love and he is a God that forgives and that he welcomes sinners to be transformed. But what the world does not want to hear is that in order to come to this loving, forgiving God, we must turn away from the destructive vices of the flesh and sin. We must repent world doesn't like that. world does not want to be told that in order for us to receive his forgiveness and to know his love, we actually have to abandon the ways of the flesh. The world says, tell me that I'm loving, but don't you tell me what I can do in my bedroom. Don't you tell me how I'm going to conduct my business. Don't you tell me what I have to do with my enemies. Tell me that you love me and that you forgive me, but don't you tell me anything about the way that I live my life. If you are going to be a Christian suited up with the armor of God, you are bringing every aspect of your life before God and saying your truth is going to direct that. What God says about love, what God says about forgiveness, what God says about truth, it is going to be directed by him, not by us. And if we exempt something from that, we're not actually being girded with the truth, the buckle that holds all things together. In fact, every other piece of this armor falls apart if we do not submit ourselves to the truth of God's word. So we continue. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, he then teaches us, secondly, Christians must remember and trust the righteousness of Christ. Look at the next phrase in verse 14. With the breastplate of righteousness in place. When Paul talks about putting on the armor of God, it is often in this letter associated with putting on the new self or putting on Jesus Christ. So we come to this text and we ask two questions. What is the breastplate of righteousness referring to and how do we put it on? So, What is the breastplate 
of righteousness referring to? Well, we already know from the last phrase that Paul had God's truth in mind when he told us to fasten on the belt of truth. So in this phrase, we should expect a similar focus, which is exactly what we find. For many of you, your Bibles have this section in italics, or maybe in all caps. And if, if not, that's okay. doesn't mean your Bible's wrong or anything like that. It's just sometimes uh, different publishers will try to highlight if a verse is drawing from the Old Testament. So it's, if it's a quotation, sometimes they'll make sure, like, you know, that, the, that, that this New Testament author is drawing on something from the Old Testament. What that's doing here, if your translations have that, is signaling that these verses are a reference to the Old Testament, specifically Isaiah 59, 17, which is going to talk about Christ or the Messiah. And here's what we read about the Lord in Isaiah 59, 17. Put on the Lord, he put on righteousness as a breastplate. Thus, the righteousness spoken of here, according to Isaiah 59, is the righteousness of the Messiah, of Christ, and according to these previous verses in Ephesians 6, part of the armor that belongs to God. Let me say that again. This righteousness belongs to God. It is said to be of God. Now, why is that significant? Because maybe you're like me growing up. The way I translated or understood and interpreted this passage was is that, oh, the breastplate that I wear into battle is my own good efforts to be a good person. Now let me ask you something. You be real honest with me. Just imagine for a second that you were going to get to go into battle next week. And the armor that you were going to wear into battle next week was based upon how well you did this week. You want to wear that battle? I mean, you want to wear that armor? Anybody? Any, anybody that confident in your flesh? No, you need to wear the armor of someone else. A perfect righteousness that you are clothed in. This is what we call the doctrine of justification. Being declared righteous on the basis of someone else's work namely Christ. So to go into battle with the enemy, I am not going to take my nicked and uh, hole-ridden, rusted out, poor, flesh-empowered righteousness and get all shot up by the devil's schemes. I am going to put on the righteousness of Christ. My breastplate is one that belongs to Jesus that is imputed to me by faith according to Romans 4 and Romans 5. So that's where we go. How do we put this on? Is it by my own effort? No. It's by faith. We put on the righteousness of God by faith. To put on the righteousness of God by faith is to live with faith and love for Christ, trusting in his righteousness as the basis of my acceptance before God. You will be full of arrows if it is your own righteousness. The only weapon that the devil can damn us with is unforgiven sin. And we strip him of this weapon when we put on the righteousness of the perfect Son of God, the righteousness of Christ. The only hope of the Christian when we face the damning methods of the devil is to look to the justifying, perfect, sufficient righteousness of Christ, which then will produce within us a fruit of holiness, which does not give provision to the lust of the flesh. So if we are going to walk into battle, not only must our lives be in complete subjection to the truth, we must cling to the righteousness of another, the one who knew no sin yet became sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of God in him. That is our hope, brothers and sisters. So we throw on the belt of truth. We have the breastplate of Christ's righteousness defending us and what do we go into battle to do? Verse 15 tells us that this next piece of God's armor is found in verse 15, which teaches us that the Christian must be prepared to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Here's the next phrase. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Again, 
Paul is drawing all from the Old Testament in these verses, specifically Isaiah 52, 7, which says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, Your God reigns. Isn't this interesting? It's somewhat of a paradox, right? Christians wage spiritual warfare by what? Preaching a gospel of peace. By peace. According to verse 15, we are called to be prepared to announce this gospel of peace at all times. This proclamation of the gospel of peace is made by those who have experienced its power, who are at peace with God. And as gospel transformed sinners, we are called to further the kingdom of God through the proclamation of the gospel, which in turn devastates the kingdom of darkness. What is going to change the kingdom of darkness that we live in in the world that, that we're, we're, we're currently inhabiting? I, I, I talked about this a little bit last week, but I, I, need, I, need to make sure, I need to make sure that you are fully, just unbelievably aware of the primacy of our commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not to the neglect of other things that are understandably important, but I'm talking about priority, primacy, the most important reality within the world. The most important reality in the world is not whether or not your neighbor agrees with your politics, but whether or not they've been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, peace. So if you can convince them to vote like you, but they don't know Jesus, you are not engaged in the battle. And the world would say, well, but really, it's a lot easier to get people motivated about politics and their favorite sports teams and all these other things. Yes, and the world is not aware of the fact, as Paul is showing us, and it, Paul has picked us up out of the fog that we're living in and said, look, we're in a battle. And the battle's not against flesh and blood. Your enemy is not your, your political enemy across the aisle. Your enemy is the evil one that seeks to devour you. And if he can get you excited about anything other than Jesus, he doesn't care what you get excited about. And so what happens is we don't share the gospel because we're so worried about other things. Now, are other things not important? I did not say that. I did not say that other things are not important. I'm saying that other things have to be brought in subjection to what? The truth of God's word and never undermine our ability to preach the gospel of peace. We preach peace to those that are far off and to those that are near, according to Paul in Ephesians 2. Proclaim the gospel. What is the gospel? It is the glorious good news that sinners like you, and you are a sinner. Romans 3 tells you, you are a sinner, and I am a sinner, and here's the good news. The good news is while you are a sinner, and while I'm a sinner, and while we deserve to be just annihilated under the wrath of God for all eternity, to have eternal conscious judgment, that's what all of our sins deserve. Because he's holy and we're not. Yet, God in his goodness says, oh, I love that world enough to send my son into it. That if they would believe in him, they would have eternal life. You came into this room maybe this morning condemned and unforgiven, and you can walk out completely clean. You, formerly a citizen of the kingdom of darkness, being transferred into the kingdom of light, and all you have to do is put your trust in Jesus. That's it. To put your hope in Jesus, to say, I, I'm on your team. I switch sides. I mean, like, I, be I believe you are who you say you are, that you deal with my sins, that you are the reason why I can be forgiven, and that you love me, and I, I want to be forgiven. And he says, all that call upon me will be saved. And if you call upon him, he will save you. You don't even have to wait until the end of the service. You can call upon him right now in your heart. So what does that look like? God, have mercy upon me. Save me. Forgive me. What if he won't? He always will. That's the lie of the enemy to tell you that, oh, there's some that he'll turn away. No. All that would come to him, by no means will he cast them out. Would you come to him this morning? Would you believe and have eternal life? Would you be forgiven? 
Would you respond to this gospel of peace? Christians, would you be prepared to share it? Without fear. We must bring our life in subjection to the truth. We must trust the righteousness of Christ. We must be prepared to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Fourth, Christians must believe the promises of God for safety and satisfaction. We consider this next phrase. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. This idea of a shield is this full body length wooden shield and there's this leather front to this shield that's been drenched in water. And so it's soaking wet leather on a full body wooden shield so that when, I mean, because obviously, right, a flaming arrow that hits a wood shield is a problem, right? You know how that works, right? The shield will burn up and you no longer have a shield. So here, the idea is, is that as the arrow hits the shield, this water-dipped leather on the cover of it extinguishes the flaming arrow of the enemy. It is not enough to simply block the arrow. The arrow needs to be extinguished. To take up the shield of faith is to trust the promises of God on our behalf. What did I tell you that, the Satan, that Satan's weapon is? Unforgiven sin, right? I mean, that, that, that is what he can hold over your head. And what is he going to tell you? You're condemned. You, you deserve hell and you're condemned. And so that's what he tells you. And it's what some of you came into this room feeling this morning. So I am condemned. That guy on that stage doesn't know what I've done. And that's true. I probably don't, though you wouldn't surprise me. I've done prison ministry, so trust me. You're not going to surprise me, and you certainly are not going to surprise Jesus. With, with that said, Satan would do nothing more than to try to keep you away from the grace of Jesus Christ. And by doing so, he tells you, he will never forgive someone like you. He will never forgive someone like you. And then maybe you're a Christian here today and you are really struggling with sin. Could be lust, could be pride, could be envy, could be discontentment, could be anger. You're going, oh, I've gone so deep into this. It's so, I'm so full of shame as a result of this. And what the enemy is doing is he is, he is flinging darts at you, hoping that what he can hit you with is the idea that you cannot be forgiven, that you are a lost cause. So the shield of faith is held out, and as the dart hits, what is the shield of faith holding on to? What is the shield of faith clinging to? It's the promise of God that your sins are forgiven and that eternal life belongs to those that put their trust in Jesus. Some of you this morning are weighed down with guilt in what you need to hear. So l- let, me, let me just for a second, because I think that the imagery here is not of an army of one, but an army of many. And I think for many of you here, maybe, possibly, some of you have put the shield down. L- let, me, let me pick it back up for you just one second. Believers, okay, this is, this is for the believers that are here. Now, for the unbelievers, this is a promise that you can have if you put your hope in Christ, but I'm speaking, I'm speaking to the sheep this morning, okay? You have put the shield down because you believe, I am condemned. You tell yourself that, you hear that. I am condemned. I am not loved. I am not forgiven. I want, I want to pick the shield up for you just for a second, and I want you to hear this. According to Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What you just heard there was the sound of an arrow hitting a shield and the arrow's flame going out. Because the promises of God are greater than the schemes of the devil. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Are you in Christ Jesus? You say, I am. I'm in him by faith. Then there is no condemnation. Drive the thought away from you. And if you are not one of his people, oh, would you not change sides this morning? For those of you that are not in Christ, you are condemned, he tells us. But you don't have to be. You can be set free. So the shield of faith takes hold of what Christ has done for us. By believing the promises of God by faith and trusting him, the lies and the schemes of the devil are unable to both pierce or burn us. And according to this phrase, the battle against the evil one is one to believe and hold on to what Christ has done for us. Which moves us then to the helmet of salvation that teaches us, fifthly, that Christians must place their hope for salvation in Christ. We've already seen this allusion to this verse in Isaiah 59, 17, where we learn that this helmet of salvation, it belongs to the Lord. We see this language used in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, which says, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. When the Apostle Paul speaks of salvation, more often than not, what he has in mind is this full or realized salvation as opposed to the initial event of our conversion, which teaches us that as Christ has dealt the death blow to our enemies and has accomplished salvation for us, we can have hope that not only has Christ begun our salvation, that he is faithful and just to bring it to completion, according to Philippians 1. 1 6 and Hebrews 12 2. According to this piece of the armor, there is no other place that the Christian can place their hope for salvation except in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our mind needs to be renewed to keep our hope and our eyes set on what Christ has promised to do for his people. So that means that at times when we're in the heat of the battle and things aren't going well and we're struggling, that we remember that our victory is secure. And that sometimes the world's going to look at us and go, that looks like defeat. And if you read the book of Revelation, oftentimes it looks like the saints are being defeated. But what does the book of Revelation do? It brings us and lifts us up to see that while the world judges victories and losses one way, Christ sees that we conquer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his testimony. That we do not have to worry because our victory is secure which then leads us to the final piece of armor that we'll see this morning where we see the role of God's word and how it works in our life as Christians. Sixthly, Christians must be saturated with the word of God. Here's the phrase. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All aspects of the armor of God up to this point are defensive. But now the apostle introduces the sword of of the spirit the sword of the spirit is nothing less than the very god breathed scriptures hebrews 4:12 describes god's word in this way the word of god is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joint and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart To use this weapon with power, one must first be filled with the Spirit who wields it. Notice it is the sword of the Spirit. We must believe it. We must read it. We must meditate on it. We must memorize it. No soldier has ever been too acquainted with their weapon. Just as Christ defeated the temptations of the devil by quoting the Holy Word, So we as his servants follow his example and resist the devil by daily and thoroughly immersing ourselves in his word, which reminds us of all of the things that we've seen regarding the hope of our salvation, regarding the safety and the satisfaction that we have through the shield of faith, which reminds us to preach the gospel earnestly into every creature, which reminds us to put our trust wholly in the righteousness of Christ and to bring every aspect of our life in subjection to the truth of God's word because we have been saved from our sins and filled with God's spirit we then as believers ought to resolve to fight the good fight of faith with the armor that God supplied for the battle furthermore we cannot fight this battle alone the imagery that Paul uses here is one of an army of many united around a common goal for the purpose of glorifying God in his grace which has beckoned us to this warfare and equipped us for this war 
Let us therefore take up the whole armor of God against our enemy and stand until the day that our Savior and our King fully delivers us from this present evil age. His promise is sure. Would you fight alongside him with the armor that he has supplied? Would you pray with me?